Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We are, um, we are in our last talk, our last talk of the day. Um, really excited to welcome Hannah Nagel. Hannah Nagel is going to be talking about research, specifically US research. Um, Hannah's talk is called Turning Research Ripples into Waves, Growing UX Research Capacity in Complex Spaces. And um, a little bit about Hannah. Hannah is a designer and researcher with experience ranging from nonprofits to startups to enterprise. And her work focuses on using a research driven approach to solve problems for people. And she's currently a service designer with Element AI. Um, so Hannah, I'm going to hand this off to you and, um, and we can get started. Perfect. So just confirming when you can see my screen. Okay. We can hear you and I'll let you know when we can see your screen. So I just pulled it up. Um, did you go to share and um, share your screen or share application? Let's see. Mm. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah, we see it. Perfect. So thank you so much for that introduction. Um, like Jen mentioned, I am a researcher and designer and I got my start in the nonprofit world. And now I work for uh, Element AI doing service design in the AI enterprise space. And today I'm going to combine a couple of my favorite topics, um, nonprofits, uh, social change, large scale change, and also raves. We're going to take a little exploration into that. And I want to combine all of those things together um, to show a couple strategies for using uh, a human centered approach and user research to really initiate that change. I'm going to talk about a couple tools that might be familiar to you if you're coming from the, the design or research space, so things like user research and systems thinking and service design. And I also want to introduce a tool that might be new to some of you, uh, which can help you to systemically approach change. But before we delve into all of that, I want to talk about uh, change in a totally separate space, which is the world of race. So if you've never been to a rave before, um, they are large underground electronic dance parties. And because they're so large, they often happen in these abandoned spaces. So out in the desert or like literally underground in basements, um, or for example, in this bus station, this abandoned bus station in Southern Tel Aviv. And because raves are mostly alcohol and therefore violence free, they're also free of police or security guards or these armed figures of the state. So raves are really happening both literally and figuratively out on the fringes of society. So outside of those systemic barriers to community and collaboration. Um, the electronic music scene was largely started by queers and folks of color. So folks who needed to come together in these new spaces um, to create both a physical and a social space where they could suspend those cultural codes and norms which might not be working for them, which might be harmful, and create these new codes of interaction. And they were also a natural place for uh, sort of creative communities and political uh, communities to kind of overlap. So really the centers of change that were underground. Um, well, I went to school in Boston with my friend Ayed, um, and when we graduated, we both moved to Israel. So I moved to Jerusalem where I was working with UNESCO, and I had moved back home to Haifa. And Haifa is a city in the north. It's often called the city of coexistence, but that's a little bit of a romanticized version of Haifa because it, Israel is a country of uh, deep division between cultures and religions and ethnicities. And it's so divided that it's possible for folks from one group to grow up and enter the workforce and never really be in a space where they can cultivate these relationships with folks from a different group. 
And it's in this divided space that Ayad and some other friends founded this underground Palestinian music collective called Jazar Crew. And Jazar Crew throws parties celebrating electronic music from these Palestinian creators. And the sentiment is that all music lovers are welcome and the only rule is to respect and care for yourselves and other people. So there's this natural overlap again of, of creativity and also political ideologies. They're throwing events like rave diplomacy um, that are intended to kind of open dialogue and support folks that are working at that cross section of arts and grassroots resistance. And these raves are happening out on the fringes of society. Um, so again, literally underground or in Ramallah, which is a city on the West Bank. So within the society, but just beyond those systemic barriers that we were all living with. And these parties started fairly small, but they've now grown large enough to travel across Europe, really rippling out as a celebration of Palestinian culture, but also a determined call for equality. And that's how real social change is made. It starts on the fringes of society, really on the periphery of that social system that you're working in. And it involves key actors who create that environment to enable that behavior to kind of ripple out and inwards towards the center of the system and really grow into a wave. So I'm going to talk a bit now about how you, we, can, we can draw from this kind of social change rippling to also create changes within large organizations, um, enterprise or government, these kind of complex spaces where we really need to embed users in the heart of our processes. Um, so with that, let's go from scaling raves to scaling UX research. Um, so just like growing a rave, growing research capacity requires designing an environment where new patterns of interaction can develop. So scaling research is also kind of a kind of social change, um, which we would define as a significant change over time in behaviors and in norms. And creating these new patterns of interaction will, will also alter the system itself. So scaling UX research is, is also a kind of systems change, um, which we would describe as new patterns of interaction that alter the system structure. And all change is hard, but this kind of change is especially tricky because social systems like um, an organization or a government, they're chaotic systems, they're complex. So they involve elements whose, whose patterns of interaction are constantly changing and these elements display a high degree of interdependence. So they're, they're deeply intertwined with each other. So planning for social systems change involves intractable or what we might call wicked problems. And there's a couple uh, elements of, of wicked problems that really differentiate them from some other challenges we see in the design space. Uh, and one challenge that we encounter when we're making these kind of large scale changes uh, is that there's no ultimate solution to your problem. Um, because of how intertwined all of those uh, social system elements are, each possible solution will trigger a wave of consequences over time. And this systemic impact, this chain of events that ripple out, it makes it hard to know immediately whether your solution is working. Um, and another wicked problem that we encounter is that there's no right solution when you're making this kind of social systems change. There's only better or worse solutions that kind of fall on the scale. So you have to determine a way that you can kind of measure that impact and, and make a good decision in that space. Something else we see um, when making these kind of large scale system changes is that the roots of the problem are kind of tangled up with the other problems. And because they don't have one single root cause, it's hard to know where to start or even to know when you're done. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about here is the different stakeholder priorities. So because there's so many different stakeholders and they have different or maybe competing values and priorities, um, there's also a lot of different ideas about what the problem really is and what its causes are and therefore what the solution should really be. So when we're looking at scaling research in these large organizations, we also have to think about this framework for tackling this kind of wicked change problem. Um, so it's a systemic problem and it needs a systemic solution. And one thing that I found very effective from the nonprofit world is looking at what we would call the theory of change. Um, and this is a tool that we can use to think about and design solutions for social impact. Um, it's where we work backwards from a planned outcome and then we help to we develop clarity around the steps that we need to achieve that intended impact so we can really create those changes that ripple out in a systemic way 
So it, it looks kind of like this. We're starting with the outcome, and then we're flowing backwards to determine which events we think would lead to that outcome, and then which activities we think would be supporting leading to the event and then leading to the outcome. Um, because social change and, and systems change involve that focus on changing patterns of interaction, those intermediate events that we're looking at, those are often related to things like behavior or procedure and methods um, and that will help us to break down a bit into the activities. So it's really taking this kind of strategic and long-term uh, planning to actually reach the outcome and really align folks and how we're going to get there. So this theory of change really encourages us to view that challenge through that, that wider view of the systems lens and think about how things are connected and who is connected in order to impact the change we want to see in our social system. And I really like this diagram from uh, Catherine Howe, who's a really great researcher, and she combines the theory of change with the systems mapping. So she has three pillars here. Uh, systems, which is the environment we're operating in and kind of the levers and constraints of that system. Um, and services, which here she calls change engine. So that's designing services to encourage the behavior change you want to see. And then users are, are the change makers. So these are the people who want to work together differently. And those are the folks who are going to ripple out those organizational or the social system changes that we want to see. So the theory of change is the systemic human-centered approach to planning for social impact. And I really want to draw on this social impact um, point for a second where we would define social impact as a significant positive change to a pressing social challenge. And I think that scaling UX research, especially in these complex spaces like government or enterprise, is becoming a pressing social challenge because tech is becoming omnipresent in our lives, both hardware and software. And that means inevitably tech is going to play a, a critical role in how we address these issues of, of climate change as well. And so we really need to put humans at the center of any of our solutions and really be thinking systemically about how they interact with each other as an organization, as individuals. And we also need to scale out or scale out rather how people feel comfortable in gathering insights about our users. Because when we think about the human experience, the user experience, when we're developing a, a product, a software platform, or even hardware, there's such a wide range of roles in, in these settings that are involved in creating it. And most of them are not UX researchers. They don't have a background in ethnography or psychology, but there's so many different roles that are involved now in making decisions that are going to impact the user experience. And so we need to equip them with a better skill set to ask the right questions and get the right answers so that we're delivering solutions that really work for the people who will be using them. So how can we work in this environment, in these kind of complex, large spaces that might be siloed and have a really wide range of roles that are involved in the process? Um, and this was kind of our, our starting point for, for my key study. Um, how can we increase the scale, scope, and speed of UX research so that we are making the right decisions when we're delivering these really foundational pieces of software or services uh, for users? So it's kind of a, a large question. It's a tough question. Um, the, the place that I chose to start was with kind of conducting internal user research because um, that's kind of what comes naturally to me as someone coming from a design and research background. So I started by framing the question um, and then discovering through data and then refining through synthesis. And if you're in um, a similar space, maybe a large enterprise or organization or government, it's also something that I uh, would encourage is to sort of turn that lens inward um, and see how, what roles are responsible for uh, delivering these services, designing these services, um, and how, you, how, therefore, you can empower them to be making these decisions. So one thing that might be helpful is starting with things uh, like journey maps or user stories. Um, if that, those are not tools that are familiar to some folks, I'd be also be happy to share some of these links in the Slack channel afterwards. Um, this can really help us get a sense of who is involved in the process and what are the different kind of touch points um, that they're interacting with. And then during our discovery phase, we're really gathering more data to deepen our understanding. So you can do this through things like surveys or interviews, um, getting kind of like a qualitative and a quantitative understanding of what's involved. Um, and then when you're refining your understanding, using things like personas or SWOT analysis um, to really narrow down what the specific nuances are that you need to focus on. 
And using these kinds of approaches, these user research approaches, will help you to understand the outcome that you need to create when you're thinking about scaling uh, user research in your own organization. So going through this process in my own context, I realized that we, I didn't just need to increase the scale, scope, and speed of UX research because that kind of isolated research. Um, and it didn't take into account how people needed to interact with these insights in order to really deliver products that were really human-centered. And so going through that user research process enabled me to refine and say, the outcome that we actually need is increasing UX research consumption. How much do people, how much can they actually engage with and act on the insights that they're being provided with? So this part led me um, to the systems thinking portion of scaling out UX research. So really looking at the whole network of folks that are involved um, in this large and complex organization um, and thinking about what were the soft spots um, or what we might call intervention points um, where we can make the biggest impact that will ripple out, and then mapping cause and effect. So really identifying uh, the relationships and the connections that kind of help maintain the system um, and thinking about which, which lever for change um, is something that will be the most impactful when scaling it up. So when you're looking for soft spots in your system, when you're looking for the right intervention points, you can actually go back and look at some of the insights you might have gathered in the user research portion. So when you hear people expressing sentiments like, I want to, but uh, that kind of will indicate to you that people are putting effort into something and they're not getting a lot out of it. Um, so an example might be if people are uh, wanting to gather better insights about their users but they don't have tools, for example, or, or a method to enable them to do that. So maybe they're doing it by hand and it's a little bit uh, tedious or, or time consuming. That might, be, uh, that might indicate to you that uh, giving, getting better tools uh, might be a good intervention point for you when you want to scale out research. And mapping cause and effect, that's a process of reviewing how the input or lever affects the outcome. So an input can be things like processes or services or activities, and the process of examining impact really requires you to articulate those assumptions. So you're making that implied causality explicit. Um, so if you're in an organization that has um, perhaps uh, some trainings, for example, to help folks conduct uh, user interviews or, or try to empower them with some um, methods to gather user insights. Um, you might want to follow up on those and explore how effective are they maybe a month after someone's taken that workshop, maybe six months after. Are they really having the effect that you think that they are in enabling people to feel comfortable and confident in gathering those insights and applying them to uh, their own work process? So this process of taking a system sticking approach uh, can help you to refine your understanding of which points in your social system, your organization, you really want to focus on. Um, and this will help you to determine which events will lead to that outcome that you've kind of determined in your user research phase. And so in, in my instance, um, I was able to determine that the three events that we needed to happen were to increase exposure to the UX research process um, to increase uh, the rate at which people could experience the value of user research on their own outcomes, um, and also to increase the amount of engagement um, where people were actually involved in conducting UX research activities, uh, whether that's like coming along to a user interview um, or maybe conducting a usability test with someone, having them be really actively engaged. And that led us to... That led us to the last portion, which was really the service design portion. And designing interventions through service design involves rethinking those organizational elements around the new service experience. So you want to think about your primary actors, your change makers, whose position within the system is going to make the most likely to ripple out that change that you want to see. And then you want to think about how you can design interventions that will encourage the desired action. And one example that I really love uh, is this concept of, of positive deviance. Um, this is a term that we see in the story of Jerry and Monique Sternin. Um, we were doing work in Vietnam and they were working towards the uh, issue of children malnourishment in these fishing villages. 
and through home observation, they were able to determine that the parents of children who were were better fed, who had higher nourishment levels, these parents were displaying positive deviant behavior. So they were collecting a tiny number of shrimps or crabs or snails from the rice paddies, and they were adding these to the children's diet. Um, and when they identified the small number of people who were, were doing something different, these positive deviants, um, they tried to scale that behavior. So they tried to pull that behavior from the outside of the social system into the center of the social system. And by replicating that positive deviant behavior, by scaling it, they were able to raise the nourishment levels to 80%. So when we're looking to scale behavior um, in service design, we're, we're looking for outliers um, who are kind of succeeding against the odds, and we want to determine what are they doing differently that's proving more effective, and how can we replicate that social behavior in order to scale up behavior in our system. Um, one tool that I found effective for doing this in the enterprise space, um, which is a, a bit different, of course, than doing uh, field work in Vietnam, um, we found uh, through a colleague at SAP, whose name is Arana Chakrabarty, um, he and some other colleagues uh, developed this program called uh, Ritual Lab. And Ritual Lab is a repeated, uh, sorry, Ritual Lab is a workshop um, where we look for positive outliers uh, doing uh, more impactful changes in their kind of design sharing, and then we scale that uh, through the organization. So the way that they've uh, kind of described it um, using this iceberg image, um, is that rituals are a repeated group activity. Um, so that may be something like design sync meetings, for example, and that would be like that middle portion of the iceberg. Um, and those rituals are a way to kind of embody values that sit below and then convert it into the action above. So for example, if your team values efficiency, um, then they might engage in the ritual of design sync meetings um, towards the action of delivering you know, wireframes or design uh, mockups faster. Um, and in order to draw on that positive deviant approach, we want to identify those outliers whose rituals, whose kind of repeated activities are resulting in actions that are more tied closely to the values. So this again is, is another framework um, that might be helpful, and I can also share these things after. Um, so going through this process of identifying values first, so conducting user interviews and then kind of synthesizing those into what we might call an archetype, um, and then understanding what are the triggers for that archetype. Um, so what kind of uh, behavior differences are they displaying that has uh, kind of pushed them into this, this archetype role? Um, and then modeling out those activities, those user research activities. Um, that we think will be more impactful and scaling throughout the organization. Um, and again, kind of drawing that connection to the nonprofit world, um, we, we do want to strike this balance between the uh, bottom up approach, or this kind of grassroots approach, um, where we really need to have empathy for the values of our users um, and encourage them to practice these new kind of user research or design rituals that we're giving to them and making it really, uh, you know, a, a low, low impact for failure, like a safe space for them to practice these new methodologies. But we also need to keep in mind uh, this kind of top-down alignment. Um, so looking at like, the board or C-level or director level, what metrics are important to them and how can we kind of reframe our efforts of uh, human-centered design or user research, how can we reframe it in language that resonates with them? Um, and a lot of times um, I've seen it kind of be a variation on the sentence, so it's maximizing your your enterprise resources or your government team resources to deliver the best experience for your users. Um, so going through this process, um, ending up in the service design, that's where you're really narrowing down on the particular activities that you want to bring to your organization and scale up. So thinking about how you can design it and who to design it for so that you can create those ripples of change within your own organization. Um, and in my instance, we broke this down uh, into uh, a newsletter and an internal website um, so that we could increase exposure to the UX research process. Um, and there can be a range of ways here that you might find are, are impactful to kind of uh, publicize and share uh, what's going on within the research or design team. 
Um, and then in terms of kind of increasing uh, the amount that people can really experience the value, um, you might uh, find value in, in something like a Slack workspace or a kind of a discussion forum um, where we can lower the barriers to interact with people in these kind of uh, service design or, or research roles. Um, or maybe having something like Ask Me Anything webinars. Um, and again, that's really about uh, getting that human connection and lowering the barrier um, to people uh, connecting with people in these uh, specialized craft research roles. Um, in terms of enabling people to better engage in research activities, um, you can think about running things like lunch and learn workshops, um, where most people, uh, you know, it may be hard to schedule people for like a two-day workshop or a one-day workshop, but if you can break it down into these chunks that are like maybe 45 minutes, um, and it, again, lowers that barrier for people to interact with this new methodology or skill, um, and just feel like it's something that they can really bring back and incorporate into their own uh, work setting. And you can also explore this kind of um, hub model for research where they're maybe paired with a researcher or a designer um, and you know, they get more comfortable practicing these kinds of uh, more basic methodologies and then they can kind of go back to their own team and, and try and scale that out. Um, so kind of creating change makers um, through this model. Um, when you're doing large scale changes, whether in the nonprofit world or in large organizations, things will definitely change. Your outcome might shift. And sometimes it can feel like things are, are falling apart a little because these are large scale, complex changes that we're talking about. Um, and what I, what I really want to impress on folks, either in the nonprofit world or the US research world, um, is that making this kind of theory of change uh, approach um, can really help you to find new paths forward um, when maybe your stakeholders withdraw support or you get new stakeholders coming in or your resources change. Having this, this kind of system mapped out where you have a range of uh, activities learning, leading to certain events and then resulting in this outcome, that allows you to, to find different paths, different avenues of success. Um, and to really keep it, to keep it visualized for yourself um, and be able to share that with other people so you can keep that, that community going. Um, so some sustainable strategies when you're, when you're trying to scale stuff up. Um, one would be uh, building a coalition of the willing. Um, so it's really, it's not a fight. Even though it's a big change and some of these things might be really different for people, you're focused on finding those kind of soft spots, those intervention points, and really building community because those advocates are what will help you to ripple that change out into ways. Um, we also want to ask local, think global, which is another thing we talk about in the nonprofit world. Um, so we're starting small with primary actors and we're learning and we're optimizing and then we're scaling up in small but sustainable steps. And lastly, we really want to give other people ownership. So we only want to take credit when, when necessary because we're facilitating change, but people need to take ownership of a problem and the solution in order for that change to really be sustainable. Um, the future is really for us, by us. So as change makers or people that are facilitating that change, we really want to empower our stakeholders and our, our colleagues and the people around us to be creating these better alternatives. Because meaningful systems level impact, it has to come from within the system itself. Uh, this is something that we, we also really value coming from the social change space, is that change cannot come from outside. It can't be forced by people who are not part of that community or part of that structure. Um, and so this, this kind of FUBU approach um, means that we're empowering people around us um, to grow and sustain that change and really be invested um, in its success. And I want to uh, end on this um, note from the social change world where I, I feel like there's, in social change there's a lot of uh, utopia, a lot of utopic thinking where we're working towards that better future. Um, and the term utopia is actually from uh, Sir Thomas More and it has these two definitions, kind of like an imaginary place or an impractical scheme for, for social improvement. So within the term itself, it's kind of this question, like, can it even happen? Is it even something that we can do? And I love this quote from Dylan Wilbanks, who's a really experienced designer. Uh, the most optimistic people are realists who keep believing in the face of frustration. Um, knowing the outcome that you're working towards, 
understanding that some of these events and activities, they might fail, they might change, but there are always other avenues forward and ways to empower the people around us to really create that sustainable change that we are trying to ripple out. Design is, is a utopic tool. It's a way for us to get from our, our current state to the future desired state. It's, it is a tool for change. And what I would like uh, folks to take away from this is that we can design the change that we want to see around us. When we take this kind of systemic approach um, and focus on that outcome, we can start small and start rippling out this change. Um, there's actually this quote from uh, the Talmud that's really been resonating with me lately. Um, and this quote says, it's not incumbent upon you to finish the work of making the world a better place but neither are you free to desist from it. And from that, I take that it's our, our professional obligation to design better alternatives, but it's also our ethical obligation as human beings to design for social impact. And this kind of systemic approach allows us to take a really wide view of the world around us, think about where we can start to make that most impact, and then start rippling out the change and creating that positive impact that we want to see in the world. And by being willing to kind of uh, engage with the constraints, engage with what we think isn't working, and then thoughtfully design interventions to impact behavior, we can really make a difference and make that shift occur um, and create those positive changes. Um, so thank you so much for listening. Um, that's the end of my talk, and I'd love to connect with folks after in the, in the Slack workspace.